I'd like this to be interactive, so please feel free if, uh, if you have any questions to stop me at any time. And since you folks are there, I'll cross over here so you can see. Okay. Um, a little bit about our firm and who we are. We manage uh, $4.4 billion at this time. We have offices in New York, Boston, Atlanta, San Francisco, Madison, Wisconsin, of all places. I don't know how we got there. Uh, Naples, Florida, Coral Gables, and Plano. Um, I'm going to give you a short advertisement about one of the products that we have that has become particularly attractive and also give you probably what you do want to hear about and that's what our economic forecast is. So I will fly through this uh, relatively quickly. One of our uh, premier portfolios that we manage is called Dynamic. And we developed this portfolio, fortunately, before uh, 2008. So 2008 was a very difficult year for many investment managers. And the number one goal is to provide downside risk controls. And our Lotus product and, and portfolios are designed for those who want to have lower volatility and want to mitigate losses. And when I go through this presentation, you'll see that we don't particularly care if we beat the market in an up market, what we care about is losing principal. And we find that by avoid loss of principal, we can do much better over the market cycle. Now, some of you know from bitter experience after uh, 2008, to recover from a 50% loss, you have to have a 100% gain the following year. The market has never done that. So uh, beginning with that thought, let's keep in mind we want to avoid losses in our portfolio. Now, interestingly enough, uh, asset allocation, if you read Leadership Investing, which we're coming out with uh, it being revisited here in about a year, whenever the editor gets done, uh, we focus a lot on asset allocation. And in the 80s and the 90s, and really beginning the first part of this decade, asset allocation was considered the key. Asset allocation was delivering 87% of the returns. But as we found out in recent years, all assets have a correlation of one in a downdraft. So you can't be safe any place when you have a significant downside in the marketplace. Um, and using asset allocation over the long term, the Standard & Poor 500 has delivered 7.3%, which is an admirable rate of return, not quite the actuarial assumption that folks look for, but a reasonable rate of return. The difference is, can you sleep at night? Uh, utilizing a approach where you miss the worst returns, but also give up the very best days in the marketplace, you average 200 basis points better. So from my way of thinking, I would prefer to avoid the downturns, sleep well at night, and understand that over the long term, I'm going to do much, much better than the market in general. We have a process, and, and I need to share with you on this particular portfolio, it is a black box. Uh, you hear about program trading, you hear about frequency trading, I'll be happy to comment on any of those. This is 100% black box. And we designed it and developed it off of our quantitative work that we manage our separately managed portfolios for. And the best way to think about this is the uh, facial recognition type of uh, programs that are out there. You see them blurry around and then they snapshot in. And that's precisely what this particular uh, process does. We want to avoid the maximum downturns in the marketplace, and we want to manage our standard deviation, and that's the volatility of our portfolios. So a key to those two are the core of what we do in this process. Now, we don't believe that everybody should have all of their assets in this type of program. We do believe you need to have a growth component, you need to have a anchor component um, or a foundation portfolio, and then you need to have a tactical implementation in your portfolio to help you become either defensive or more assertive in the marketplace. Now, the key components of this are that we offer broad diversification in all 10 sectors of the investment markets, and I'll go through them in just a second. But we maintain equity exposure during sustained bull markets for maximum growth potential, and we have an ability to increase or decrease both our sector weightings and cash as market conditions deteriorate. So what we feature is a de-risking mechanism in the portfolio. 
And this de-risking mechanism is known as a negative beta ETF. And what a negative beta ETF is, is that if the market goes down, it goes up in value. If the market goes up, it goes down in value. So we want to have a delicate combination of equities that we hope will go up, and at the right time, a negative beta ETF that will protect us during the downside. So as we go through our portfolios, uh, when we have a low risk, low volatility situation, we'll be 100% invested. As we have rising volatility, we will begin to add our negative beta ETF into the portfolio when we reach a 30% exposure to negative uh, beta or declines uh, potential, we then go 100% cash. A simple strategy, everybody would like to do it. It seems to be a bit more difficult for everybody to do though. Um, in each one of the 10 sectors, we begin with something that's unusual. And that is that we will equal weight each one of these sectors. As you know, technology or healthcare is greater than 10% in each sector. And these weights will change over time. As in 1990, technology was 62% of the market. And it went down quite below that. So we will begin with an equal weighting. And this is not sector rotation. I want to underscore that. It is not a sector rotation strategy. What we will do is overweight and underweight dependent on the participation in the market cycle of each one of these sectors. And then we will, of course, eliminate sectors in with the negative beta ETF until we have a 30% exposure in negative contrary weightings, and then we go to cash. We stay to cash until we get a positive reversal in the marketplace. Uh, the returns in this portfolio have been pretty good. Uh, the key, of course, is avoiding the downturn. And let's go back to 2008, if I can. Um, as you can see, earlier in our, in our program, we did pretty good against the market. We were competitive. It is not our goal to beat the market on the upside. I am perfectly happy delivering a 10% rate of return when the market's at 12, if I can avoid the 15 or 20% downside. And as you see in 2008, uh, when we had a, a correlation of one, everything in the world went down, our portfolios were off 2.36%. So if you look at that, virtually all of our outperformance was generated by that one stylistic move. And as we've gone through time, we've continued to raise cash uh, throughout. We were extremely lucky this year. This is not our plan. We were up 32.12% net after all fees and expenses, while the market was up 32.39. A more realistic uh, return expectation is 14 versus 16, or uh, let's just see here, 27 versus 28, uh, minus one versus plus two. That, that is something that our clients should expect. Um, I will end this right now by telling you we can do a lot of service for you. And we'd be happy to talk with anybody about uh, what we can do for you in that regard. Now what I'd like to talk to you about is what we think, and again, these are my opinions. Um, you, can, you can debate them. We're open for dialogue. The one thing about the market is there's always a debate going. And the number one debate is between two warring factions. And one of them is technicals, and the other one is fundamentals. And I'd like to share with you just a couple of points when we look at this chart. If you'll notice, in 97, 2002, and 2009, we seem to have a pretty common number here in the S&P 500. And what technical investors would do is call this a support line. And then we had a very common group of numbers up here around 1500 in the S&P 500. And technical investors would call this a resistance line. But there's something very, very different about the fundamental side of this marketplace. Here, we were at 16 times earnings. And at the peak of the market, we were at 25 times earnings. 
that is the very last normalized market that we have experienced. And we'll go through this in one of the concluding charts. But ever since then, everything has been abnormal. A normal market uh, will go between somewhere between 10 and 30 times operating earnings, forward operating earnings. We go through that spectrum. There is a hate period where nobody wants stocks. Hate periods are generally down here. And no matter what stocks do, no matter what their earnings are, no matter what the economic outlook is, because there is rampant negative consumer sentiment, uh, stocks are in the doldrums. And then as consumer sentiment in the economy improves, we go through what's known as P.E. multiple expansion. And the P.E.s will expand because earnings are going up, but optimism is going up even more than that. Eventually you get to a breaking point where earnings can no longer sustain themselves, and typically we go into either economic setback or recession, typically uh, preceded by inverted yield curves. So that's a normalized market. Thank you. And it's typically a three to five year cycle. The 90s was a little bit longer. Uh, we had our correction. Uh, along in this came uh, September 11th. And, but we were at 25 times earnings. We went down to 14 times earnings. Now we use forward operating earnings in our analysis. And what forward operating er earnings are are not what you see on TV. Those are reported earnings. And reported earnings are just like your tax return. It's what, what you made after you pay your taxes and deductions. But operating earnings is cash flow. And that's how everybody makes their decisions. Do we buy a truck or not? Do we invest in something? It all depends on the cash that we have. So this market came back up at, to 1,500 where we reached a technical resistance. It was only 15 times earnings. So what we call this is a stair-step recovery. And what that means is that as earnings began to improve, the market responded, but not with PE multiple expansion. We had the financial crisis, which is abnormal, and we came all the way down to 10 times operating earnings. The stock market has never in history, ever, gotten lower than 10 times operating earnings and never higher than 30 times operating earnings. So those should give you a good fundamental band. Now we've had a stair step back, but interestingly enough, 25 times earnings, 15 times earnings. So we are now at all time highs, but we're only at 15 times operating earnings. The market arguably is cheaper here than it was there. Now, if we think this is unusual and we think it's different this time, it's not. Everybody will come out and say, oh, it's different this time. Things will sustain, they'll go on, there, there's a new world. Uh, no, it's not. We tend to have these cycles repeat themselves, and what has happened here is that we have had what's typically called a breakout. So the resistance line has now become the new support line. And that's important to understand because this market come, can come back and test that at any time. The higher we go up in the PE multiple expansion, the greater the opportunity is for the decline. Now let's take a look at the European markets. We happen to be in our privately or separately managed portfolios and in our international portfolio. We are very favorably disposed towards international securities. And they are simply three years behind the United States in the recovery. And so we have begun focusing a lot. You'll see the same sort of pattern here. But you see that the earnings have not yet recovered. And we all know the story about Greece and Spain and, and so on. Those have begun to turn the course, like turning around the Queen Mary in a bathtub. It's slow. It's going to take time. But now Spain has some of the largest construction in the world. The Greek market was up some 50% over the last year. So there are real opportunities in global dominators that are not located in the United States. Let's talk about both of these economies. Um, the economic growth and revenue growth has continued to expand, and the PMI, Purchasing Managers Index, looks very, very favorable. Now, why is this important? When we get to 
of manufacturing capacity, that is considered full utilization. And companies need to do one thing or another. They need to hire people to expand the plants and capacity and run them until they run into the ground, or they need to build new plant and capacity. Well, they haven't done either yet, and they typically don't do either until we get to 82%. But the Purchasing Managers Index indicates that we're getting a substantial increase in forward orders. If we do not invest in plant and capital, the alternative is known as cost push inflation. And that's not very good because it squeezes the profit margins of the, of the producer. So it's inevitable that we're going to see a significant increase in plant and capital investment and also manufacturing that is returning to the United States. In uh, 2007, I gave a brilliant speech in which I predicted that there would be no manufacturing in the United States by the year 2015. And that has completely reversed itself. Now that we have a parity, it's actually cheaper to manufacture in Mexico than it is in China today. And we're beginning to see the return and resurgence of manufacturing in the United States, which bodes well for the real estate industry and many, many other industries. <coughs> Uh, operating profit margins. This is uh, where we can have a debate. The United States is not only high, it's higher than it ever has been. So not only have we recovered, we have recovered and exceeded in many areas of the economy and the leading indices. Europe, as you can see, would require a leap of faith. It's still turning around very, very slowly. And the earnings per share forecast which we believe Wall Street is always wrong on forecasts, and I can go into that on why, and we can, we can show you some documentation on that. We believe that the forecasts here are wrong, and they might be slightly optimistic in the United States. Simply stated, when, when the economy is tough, analysts tend to be very conservative. When the economy is good, they tend to be over-exuberant. And the long-term record is, is very poor. Um, we've been through both a 30-year bull market in bonds right here, and we had a 30-year bear market in bonds. Now, those of you who, I started in the business in 1972. Um, and in 1981, I recall going very, very heavy into tell strips. If anybody's been around long enough to know what those are, those were the telephone eight and three quarter, 2,000 non-callable bonds at trading at 540, yielding 15%. And they also had options to purchase stock. Holding those bonds until they matured in 2000 generated a 15% a year return and a double on the money. So there is a time to own bonds, and only 6% of the time do long-term bonds yield more than 6.1%. So if you take away anything from this meeting, it's this, when bonds are over 6%, it's a good time to buy them. But we've gone through this 30-year bull market of declining interest rates, and a lot of it has been artificial, as we know. We've had stimulus that has occurred, but we have just seen a major reversal. And if you own bonds, long-term bonds, you lost 9%. As we all know, a 1% increase in interest rates has a 10% principal impact. And if interest rates continue to rise and go back to a normal 4.5%, there's another 30, 35% downside in bonds. So the key takeaway in that is active duration management. Um, there's another factor here that we want to take a look at on why the market is likely to have PE multiple expansion. Um, first of all, if we take a look at domestic equities and world equities, there's $7 trillion worth of equities out there. Interestingly enough, there's only $2 trillion outside the United States. So if you want to talk about a limited supply, it's really there in non-U.S. companies. If we take the non-equity investments and add them up, they equal these. So what happens to these non-equity investments that are in bonds and cash? These are liquid investments, not real estate. What happens to these monies when, when rising interest rates occur? 
And this is precisely what happens. People liquidate just like they do at the bottom of a stock market. People and companies and pension funds liquidate their bonds, and where can they go? They can go to money markets, treasury bills, which are safe. They can go to real estate, which can produce income. Or they can go to the stock market. And you see what here is called a great rotation. When you hear that term, we're getting a great rotation from bonds into equities. The reverse of that is disintermediation, when bonds are yielding 6% and people take their money out of the stock market to get that safe yield. Um, let's move on. Now, we had a great year last year. So I've been in this market since 1972. In 1972, if we did 10 million shares, we would all be in the bullpen and we'd get up and clap. Because it was really a high volume day. 10 million shares in 1972. And I've seen a lot of good markets. I've also seen a lot of bad markets. And there's one thing I've learned out of this, and that is great humility and to realize that we oftentimes confuse brains with bull markets. When we have the market go up more than 20%, it's generally followed by a mediocre year. The market has been up 21 times. This is not statistics, this is fact. It's been up 21 times uh, since 1945. It's been up more than 21%, excuse me, more than 20%, 21 times, okay? But the following year's average return was 10%. So it's just like you don't buy last year's best stock because it probably won't do as well this year. Last year's market is history, and the facts are the following year tends to be more mediocre or more long-term average. Uh, the average drawdown is 12% following a good run-up. Well, we may have seen two-thirds of that uh, earlier this year. Peak earnings uh, per share per quarter were $24. We dropped down to, uh, uh, let's see, 17, no, $16 at the bottom of the market. And we're now at $28 per share. But here's the interesting thing. Corporate profits tend to peak at about 10% on average. It's very, very hard on average for corporations to just generate more than that. And we are at the peak. And what is likely to happen is as capital continues to be deployed, we are probably going to stay at that peak level or possibly decline a bit as investment is made into people and plant <coughs> and equipment because you don't get an immediate return on that. So this year, that's part of the reason you might find some softness in earnings and therefore not as good a market opportunity. But here's the key to your answer, and that's total leverage. Companies have deleveraged dramatically. Look at that amount of leveraging that's deleveraging has occurred. Companies have raised cash, they haven't spent it, they've floated bonds, they've fixed their interest rates for the future, and they're sitting on it or they're buying back their own stock. They have not yet invested it. You're going to see a significant reinvestment in this economy over the next few years. Um, civilian unemployment. Now, this is a number that we don't know if it's right or if, if it's wrong. You know, the economists will say that the true unemployment was closer to 20% when you count those that are not looking and uh, you count those that are not on the, or that are illegal and, and looking for work or not looking for work. But this is the best statistic we have. And it looks like 6% is the new 5%. When I grew up and was trained, we were thinking that four, four and a half percent was full employment. Well, it looks like we're going to have a chronic unemployment problem in this country due to a number of factors, and one of them is the results of the Great Society that we started in 1966. There are a number of other factors that are out there too. But we're seeing a rapid decline in unemployment, 6.7 percent. We're probably going to see this continue to edge on down. Now here's another chart that may be inaccurate. We lost 8.8 .8 million jobs. We've gained 8.7 million jobs. So one could argue we're back to where we were. But this does not take into account the rising population that we've had. 
So this is perhaps close to being accurate. Here's the consumer. Uh, this is surprising. And, and it took me a while to really get confidence in this. Total assets, $94 trillion, homes 23, other tangible 6, deposits 10, pension funds 21, other financial assets 40%, total liabilities 13.8. Look how small non-revolving auto loans, other liabilities, and student debt are. The number one is mortgages for homes. So if we take a look at the household net worth, it's come up. But we're not spending it. The reason it's come up is we're not spending it. Because we as consumers still are a bit of doubting Thomases in the future of this country, in the future of what's going to happen. And debt service ratio has gone down dramatically, down 35%. So American consumers, instead of spending, are saving and paying down debt. Okay, here's normalized markets. <coughs> Now, we've devised red light, yellow light, green light. And as I said before, the stock market has never traded less than 10 times operating earnings. Never. And it's never traded more than 31 times forward operating earnings. That's cash flow, not reported earnings. And as you might suspect, it's a bell curve, and it's a skewed one. Down here, we call this green light zone because it's a good time to buy. Don't confuse green light with safe, but when PE multiples are under 13.6 times, it's about 20% of the time in the stock market. And during that 20% of the time, that is the time to become fully invested in equities. Now, in the back, uh, I believe, oh, in that one, I've updated it. This chart, we didn't get updated when we put the deck together, but in that one, you can see, I believe it was March of 14, is right here. So we're right down here. And what we've done, we were trading at 13 times earnings for several, several years in this stair step recovery. Now we've just begun to have PE multiple expansion. So yellow light zone, that's a normal market. We have an expanding, we have rolling readjustments, people are investing. And then we get into red light zone markets. Where do you think most people invest? Right here. Why? Because the market has gone up for 15, 16% a year. And what do we, you know, we need to get in. In fact, I was fired by one of our big clients in two in uh, December of 1999. We were up 29% uh, that year. The market was up 32%. He called me and he says, why do I need a professional money manager? Sell everything. I want you to put it into Qualcomm, WorldCom, and Enron. <laughs> True story. True story. How much did they lose? All of it. So this is where consumers buy, but this is, whoops, this is where we want to sell. And the correct thing to do is, I don't want to end the show, I'll just leave that there for a second. Yeah. What we want to do is utilize our asset allocation to begin to pull away from the market and sell into the headiness. Bernard Baruch said, when, I, when the shoeshine boy is giving me tips on the stock market, I'm getting out, and that's why he shorted the market. Do you recall in, in 1999, there were newspaper ads and there were television ads and the hairdresser was getting into the market? Okay, it's not different any time. All markets and market psychology are alike. Here's the same chart. Now, these points go back to the fourth quarter of 1991. In January 10th, 2000, we wrote a letter to our clients and we said we believe that the current market is unsustainable and that the decline that you will see will uh, exceed that of tulip bulbs in Holland in the 1700s. And why do we write that letter? 
We wrote that letter because there we ended up at 29.87 times earnings. Very simple. What do we do with most of our clients? We took a third to a half out of the market, either paid down debt, paid off, of ho paid off houses, and bought bonds. Bonds were trading somewhere around 6.5% at that time. So the market has been trading down here in this yellow light zone virtually ever since and barely has gotten into green light. Now the reason why you see these from 12 and so on and here at 13 is this is a variable line. We, we try to keep it in the 20 to 22 percent level. Now why do you see this cluster here? The reason you see this cluster is we are now transitioning from government support to business leadership. Every time we get into a recession, what happens? Interest rates are lower, stimulation occurs. This time it's no different. It's been a lot longer. But as the economy improves, the Federal Reserve tapers and business takes over. So since it takes a couple of years, we tend to cluster around here for a bit. And then we get PE multiple expansion. A 10 point improvement in consumer sentiment equals a 2 PE multiple expansion. Okay? We get 10 points more optimistic, we go from 15 to 17 times earnings. Very simple. The uh, confidence index right now, or the sentiment index right now is 80. The peak is 120. That's a 50% potential improvement in confidence. So, the outlook, we think, in the next several years is very, very good for liquid asset markets. It's going to have corrections. When we get into these levels, we have a normalized 8 to 10 percent corrections. When we get here, we get 20 percent corrections. And if you go back through time, you'll see it uh, repeat itself and repeat itself and repeat itself. Here's that uh, point about consumer sentiment. Whoops, where'd I go here? 10 point rise, 2 PE multiple expansion. Now, uh, I guess I skipped over this chart. Where are we right now in the marketplace? We are average. We're at the average multiple. So, where do we go from here? And that's the big argument in the debate. And our bias is that we are slowly bringing things back. We are now in a globalized economy. As Adam Smith and Malthus would say, when you get in a globalized society, the only difference is the cost of transportation. And that, that seems to be true right now. We're getting all these global economies coming to some form of price parity. or getting very, very close to price parity. We've had the number of consumers Quad, uh, middle class consumers quadruple in the last 20 years. So a world that had 300 million Americans supporting the entire globe by their consumption now has that many in India and has that many in China. There's 300 million people in Europe. There's 10 people in Russia that own all the wealth. <laughs> <laughs> but we're getting this growing middle class. But we don't think that middle class is going to be as prosperous as previous years. Now here's an interesting chart, and it's, it's, this is opinion, okay? This is opinion based on yields, and what it says is very this, uh, is this. When you take a look at the yields offered in emerging companies, in emerging countries, versus mature companies, there tends to be more opportunity. But what this chart says that I don't like is it says that there's less risk, which I don't believe. So yes, we think there's great opportunity, but we also think there is much higher risk in the emerging markets. And you really need to be skilled in that. And if you're going to look at that, I'd prefer you get an ETF that is country specific. Um, and the last one, is going back to what is now widely considered a flawed strategy, and that's buy and hold, as I showed you before, 
We've had uh, some 9%, 200 basis points uh, premium over the long term. When you do your asset diver diversification, no matter how wide you go, you have about a 7% return. But look what the average investor does. We, uh, we have a large number of 401k plans. And in those 401k plans, we tracked the actions of the investor. And the investor today can trade every day. They can go wherever they want to with 20, 30, 40 different mutual funds, maybe even more. And what we found <coughs> is that the average investor is the worst indicator out there for the stock market. They always tend to buy last year's best performer or last quarter's best performer. Well, this doesn't surprise you. Look how REITs, which means real estate, look how well they've done. Oil. Uh, you, you hear the ads today about own your own oil well? Have you heard those ads, anybody, on CNBC? <coughs> what does that tell you? When, when the doorman gets to own his own oil well, there may be too much fluff in it, okay? Uh, homes, pretty good investment right now. S&P, pretty good, we think, and so on. There is a whole new psychological theory out there about the emotional investor. And it's a, a brand new area that's being written about. And if you have an opportunity to read the very best book ever written about investments and investor psychology, it's called Leadership Investing. I happen to know the author. Yeah. And it has quite a bit about emotional investing in there. And there are two primary drivers, fear and greed. Fear and greed. But that's always been there. And, but I agree, it's a bigger factor today, particularly those of us who are baby boomers and have seen our retirement portfolios slashed. And unfortunately, a lot of people couldn't stand the pain and got out. So when we work with an individual client, we ask them the following. Do you have your cash flow needs met? Are you a long-term investor? And three, what level, of what level of volatility can you tolerate? And everybody lies about question number three. Everybody, nobody has ever told us the truth. And that is why we have taken the forefront with our dynamic portfolio.